Hey y'all, to get a taste of this delicious meal, go ahead and check out my OnlyFans page for recipes in the description box below. You find the link, yes. So I just woke up, I was supposed to do this review yesterday, but for the first time in a long time, I was able to go out and do something that's considered fun, because I'm usually always working and at home and whatnot. So yesterday I had fun, which did not let me do my P Valley season two, episode five review and the basketball wives review so i'm gonna do two reviews back to back this one and the basketball wives one okay so this episode oh my god <laughs> i'm not usually a p valley this is my first i had to binge watch to even catch up number one and once i started i couldn't stop now the same person who suggested that i watch p valley also suggested that i watch the shy so i might actually review that one too once i ca catch up to all the seasons and whatnot but P-Valley just has so much and let's get into it and attention this will be a spoiler alert so if you have not seen the episode you should watch this review still I'm just saying but if you haven't seen the episode there will be some information that I will disclose because I have to review it so let's get into it so this episode was narrated by Uncle Cliff okay and he's basically telling us the story of uh Keyshawn you know cook a letter cook a letter cook a letter Miss Mississippi and her fine ass so we, you know, they're telling us a story that kind of explains her road to how she got to where she got and how her situation is the way she is. Because some of us tend to watch when somebody's being abused physically and being beaten, by the way. And then what you say is, you know, why does this person choose to stay? How can this person stay in this situation? Do they not know that this is wrong? Why would you stay there when somebody's whooping your behind? Why don't you just go and find somebody else? You have the money. You're the one making the money. So why don't you go ahead and leave and get yourself in a good situation? People don't understand that in an abusive situation, it's not just the physical part. There's also the mental part. There's also the emotional part. And that's usually what makes it very difficult for somebody who's in an abusive situation to leave. And so they're about to explain to us exactly how Miss Mississippi herself got to this situation. So that's essentially what this episode is about. But they had a special appearance with Jessica Dime, Miami Tip, Gigi McGuire, and Jocelyn Hernandez herself, the best. <laughs> the baddest Puerto Rican princess, according to her, she came here into this episode and she made her debut, which shows that Jocelyn is actually doing well for herself outside of Zeus and outside of Steve, who thought that she would just go back to the strip club. She did go back to the strip club, but she did it on TV. So she's making money. Meanwhile, you and Faith over there and she's about to leave you. So the episode starts and we got Jessica Dime um and uh uh miami tip they're there to watch a show that it looks like jocelyn is going to be the opening act and then she's going to now introduce Keyshawn, aka crickletter crickletter to come there and then perform in the back while everybody's in the stage waiting and, and you got uh big teak and little murder arguing like an old married couple about just arguing you got rome Keyshawn's manager in the back talking to her and basically letting her know about the new wig line that apparently he's trying to get her but he puts on this blonde wig on her now don't get me wrong Keyshawn is beautiful with any color wig that she has on her head but she says something that makes sense she looked kind of ghetto she looked like the ghetto ratchet stripper girl with the blonde long wig she's a beautiful barbie doll type look but it doesn't look classy in a way that i think Keyshawn herself would prefer considering the background that she came from which i'm going to explain to you where she came from because she came from money right so when she said ghetto you had rome doing everything he can to up I guess her vision of or his or vision to make her look like the way it is, but it's like him dressing her in the image that he sees her. And it's not really her doing what she wants to do for herself. You can see the discomfort that she had. But then Jocelyn performs, and while she's performing, Rome tells her that they are now going to go on a tour for two more weeks. She's thinking that they're just gonna be on tour for one more week and she can go back to her man, knowing that her man is an abusive person and she got two kids at home with that man. So she's in a hurry to get back, but she's the breadwinner of the family. So she's also wanting to make money. So she's kind of torn between the two. Ideally, as a parent, I would never leave my child with somebody who's beating me up. My babies with somebody. I don't care if you're the father. If you can hit me, the person you're supposed to love, you will hit my children. And if I'm not there to protect them, you won't, it won't, they won't be with you. But I know that Kishana is also considering that. She kind of left in a hurry. She left, she left without his consent. Now, Rome is saying that he already talked to his, he talked to, he's like, I already talked to your white boy and I already smoothed things out. He doesn't know that, yeah, 
Derek will be will seem calm on the phone, but if he's mad, Keyshawn's not there for him to beat on her. So the only person that's left is for him to beat on the kids in his rage. He's not gonna hit the wall like I would hope he would. So she's already worried in her head, but he's like trying to distract her and he's doing kind of sneaky things because he didn't even discuss this with her. He just made the decision. I'm looking at Rome kind of sideways at this point. Then Jocelyn does her little performance is not as good as Keyshawn's. I'm going to say so. Jocelyn looks like she's had a few work done on her body. She's older. She still has a nice body. But when Keyshawn comes out and the way that Keyshawn worked that pole, I don't think Jocelyn can work a pole like that anymore. But Keyshawn did a good job and she murdered that pole and low murder and big teak. You can tell that Rome is noticing that they're going through something because he come in here like, why are y'all arguing? And the two men and I know we're not because it makes them look like they're together and they're still trying to pretend like they're not, you know, doing each other. Then... We got Uncle Clifford now continue his narration and then they kind of start flashing back to Keyshawn's past. In her past, we see her stepmom, we see her one, her, one of her stepsisters, Alicia. Keyshawn is practicing on what looked like a cheerleading team and Derek was one of the guys holding her up and uh, you know, trying to perform one of the little acts they have to do. And Keyshawn cannot stay up there. She kind of falls. And so her sister, Alicia, who's supposed to be the perfect life skin one, comes out, does the same thing, and she's able to actually keep herself leveled, and she's good. Keyshawn is sitting on the bench, and she's already acknowledging that those are her step, that's her stepsister, not her real sister. She's already making the distinction in a sour way. So we know that they're not really on the same level at home. Then one football dude comes over one black dude comes over and he's kind of doing this mean football player type thing he's popular by being mean to other people so he's being mean to Keyshawn, and he thinks it's funny so then you have this derek white man about to come and save play captain save a future hoe come up and he's like yo don't talk to the lady like that type dynamic and the dude keeps running his mouth he's like look at this white boy you know it's mississippi so there's race situation going on so he's thinking that derek is a punk derek is walking away and this fool spits on him and i mean he spits on him in the back of his head like he hurled that loogie at the back of his head and i wasn't even mad about derek whooping his behind at this point because i will sure whoop you if you spit on me what do you think i'm a piece of trash so he spit on him and next you know derek is on top of him just wailing on him you got two guys try to move, move derek and derek is mm -mm, he wouldn't allow it derek beat the heck out, he beat the dog shit out of these dudes he whooped them he whooped them i didn't feel sorry because sean's up there looking at him like she don't know if she was turned on or if she should be scared. She was just a combination of both. Then, you know, inside of the school, we find out that Derek is about to graduate. Derek is giving her a compliment saying, you know, I could have kept you up there. Don't listen to them. He's now, you know, making his move, showing that he's interested in her. He seems very calm, very soft-spoken. He seems very gentle. He's cute, though. Keyshawn's attracted to him. Keyshawn, at this point, we don't know that she has a low self-esteem. We can see that she kind of has, she's showing signs of somebody with low self-esteem, but not to the extent of it. And people who abuse you, they tend to have a radar. Like they know who they're supposed to target and who are the type of people that would be able to even fall for their crap. So he's already smoothed things over, talking to her, giving compliments, telling her that she's this, she's great, she could be better. She, they know what they're saying is not true. Keyshawn said, mentioned something about him picking a fight. He said, I didn't start it, but I finished it. And that was like a hint of this is how he acts. But Keyshawn is looking at it like he's still cool. So he walks away because he's making his move slowly. They show Keyshawn at her house, at her daddy's house. And then we find out that Keyshawn... Um, Keyshawn's stepmom is over there watching as Keyshawn is doing her daughters. One of them, the, the name we saw is Alicia and the other one's named Laronica. Lord have mercy. Where did that name come from? You can just go with simple Veronica, you Laronica. That's so ghetto. I'm sorry. It's very ghetto. But she end up doing their hair. And while she's doing their hair, she burns Laronica's hair. And um, her stepmom gets mad at her you know, for burning her daughter's hair. She already made a comment saying that it's difficult raising two kids. Keyshawn wasn't even on her radar or somebody that she's raising. Keyshawn had to remind her, like, you got three kids you're raising, you married my daddy. And so she's basically serving as almost like the maid a little bit, but she's very beautiful. But they're looking at Alicia as a light-skinned girl that's just beautiful and brown. And it just kind of puts, sets the stage to what her family dynamic is. Then... Where was I? So then um, we get to the part where they're at a restaurant and Derek asked to take Keyshawn, took Keyshawn to a restaurant, found her in the rain, took her to go and eat. It's not supposed to be a date. It was supposed to be something he saw her. He just saw her walking in the rain with a book covered in her head. He was a white, a knight in, a white knight, you know, the knight in shining armor came over there to save her and um, took her out to eat. And the person who's serving them, if y'all notice, is Miss Preacher Patrice. 
She's the one serving them. As young as she was back then, as beautiful as she still looks, she was saying, you know, well, you can pick whatever you want. This white boy can afford it type thing. And Keyshawn is basically looking all nervous. And then you notice that there is a scratch on that dude's head. Now, they didn't really say it, but if I was to guess, his dad probably did that to him. His dad probably punched him and left a knot in his face. But he blamed it on something. Say he, it was a pyramid or something that went wrong. That wasn't no dang pyramid. He was being beaten himself. People who abuse other people usually do it from a learned behavior. This is something that you grew up seeing, so now you know how to navigate it in your own life. But Keyshawn now still doesn't know that that's the situation. So Christmas comes, and they're in their house. Their daddy, James, is now in the house. Keyshawn's dad is in the house. He's taking a picture of Alicia and Laronica with their dates, and the, and the bell rings. But he tells Keyshawn, can you take a picture of me and them? Like Keyshawn is just a girl that doesn't exist anymore. And you notice something that's kind of creepy. While Keyshawn is taking the picture, her dad is giving Alicia kisses in the forehead like Alicia is his daughter or someone he kind of looks like there's an attraction to. And you see Alicia makes a face like she's disgusted. Uh, then the door rings, they get to the door, you got the white knight there. Derek is there with this beautiful ball gown, blue color that looks like he just went and picked up something that was super expensive. He came with a corsage, he came with a shoe. He literally just made her into his image of what he pictured her looking like. She didn't get to pick none of it. She went upstairs, did some setups so she could fit into the clothes, put it on and look like, they look like the best couple at that dance. She blew her sisters out the water because of how gorgeous she is. But again, Keyshawn doesn't know how beautiful she herself is. And Keyshawn already made it known to the stepmom that she was a homewrecker turned homemaker. She told the story of how she met her dad. And she said, I just served him some alcohol on a plane like she was a flight attendant. And Keyshawn said, well, you forgot the part that you also served his wife as well, AKA her mama. And she was like, well, we can see it differently. And Keyshawn said, no, that's the truth. They start arguing. And she said something like, this is why James left your mama. You still ghetto. Because Keyshawn was like, you don't know me like that. You don't know who the type of person I am. I will still fight you. I don't give up. She was basically thugging it out with her. And so that we kind of just get the image, the impression of this is how she sees Keyshawn. And she's this delusional housewife that thinks she got the man, but she got the man in a hard way. And you know that the way you get him is how you lose him. You understand that? So it's like we're watching this dysfunction with Keyshawn's family and she's the outcast. She's the one that nobody notices. She's the one that they don't care about. She's the afterthought. The dad is focused on his new wife, his new family. Hell, he's even attract attracted to one of the daughters that he's, you know, it's just, it's too much. Then you got the white knight who comes around, who gives her the attention she's not getting at home, who makes her look beautiful, who makes her feel like she's gorgeous, who makes her feel like she's it. They have sex that night at that after that ball. In the car, she does everything she can to make that man happy. She really gets into it and, you know, she she really gets gives it to him. I mean, in that car, she did a good job. She comes home and her mom gives her, her stepmom, she comes home late. Her stepmom is sitting on the couch. She's drinking and she's already in tears. And she gives her an advice. She said that, you know, be careful of not becoming a man's Barbie doll. He'll always find someone to buy. As in... You need to be careful. She didn't pick that dress. She didn't pick that clothes. You're having a man mold you into the image of who he thinks you are. And that can also be done with somebody else. It's not just you. So you need to be careful about being kept, that kind of thing. So we get back to Jocelyn and Jessica Dime and you know her performance. And Jocelyn is now talking to Miss Mississippi and she gives her her own advice. She says to them, you will always be a hoe. But Cardi B says a hoe ain't never cold. So she's basically pumping her head up too, saying I'm talking to another bad, you know, you're fine too, you're this, this, and the third. Keyshawn, you can tell in these two situations, Keyshawn does not know her worth. She doesn't know her worth. And so she fell for this person who made her feel like she was important, but she didn't realize the extent of it. So then they flash back to what's going on with her. She's pregnant. She's full on pregnant now. And her man and her living in some shacked up whatever apartment with a curtain that looks like it's halfway falling off. You can tell they don't have money. And so he's supposed to be, initially he was supposed to have a football scholarship from what we saw. He was supposed to go play professional football so his parents don't have to worry about his tuition. But it looks like things fell through. She's now pregnant, she's carrying his baby. They're in the house, she's sitting down, she's not working. He's bringing stuff as much as he can to help the baby, but she's you know, clowning the stuff. She's pregnant, emotional talking about these things are so ugly, it's ugly. Next thing you know, the guy grabs her by her neck and that's one of the first incidences of abuse. He's choking almost the life out of her. She can't breathe. She's on the couch and she's pregnant with his baby. Now, she 
did the first thing that anybody who's in shock about a physical abuse would do. She got up, she went back to her father's house, but her stepmom already didn't love her before, so she was gonna help her now. She said, uh-uh, you cannot bring any of this around my daughters. I can't have them watching this. Like, I don't even wanna deal with this extra issue. You got yourself in this problem. I didn't take your mama's house and your, your daddy, so you could just go with your bad kids, whatever, that you're, with your baby, we don't want you here. You're spoiled, you're damaged goods, you make us look bad. We don't, we have an image to keep up. So Keyshawn said she made a mistake. She said, mm, you're gonna have to deal with this mistake. So she let her live and she let her go and Keyshawn had no other place to go but the same place that she was before. She gets to the house and of course Derek didn't have the entire room covered in roses which is the first sign of somebody who first initially abused you. They do something extravagant to make you think that they're not this way and that they just made a huge mistake. And she stayed, right? Then we flash forward to the future. They're in a hotel and um, they're enjoying their money, Lil Murder, Big Teak already has his attitude as usual whenever he's seen Lil Murder talk to Wodey. You already tell the man is a very jealous person. And you see him having a bad attitude and you see Keyshawn look at Woody and they're talking in the head like, are these two effing each other? And Woody's like, yep, this they are. And Lil Murder say he's gonna go check on Big Teak to make sure he's okay. Woody suggests that Lil Murder find him a female. The look the little murder gave him would have been like a look of death. Don't don't even say that. You know you know the truth. You know who I am. Don't even say that stuff to me. So they walk and then Rome comes in and Rome comes in saying that he got them all their hotels, but he says basically that he got Keyshawn almost the same hotel area where he's in. Keyshawn is realizing what's going on. Big T said he don't want his hand me downs. Throws the keys away and whatnot. Rome tells Keyshawn when you're ready to leave these fools, you can come to where I'm at because he's always bragging that he's the better manager than Woody. So, or Woody. So Keyshawn tells Woody that he's gonna go over to Rome's apartment and he's gonna make sure that he, you know, they get more, you know, keys to better rooms and stuff like that. And Woody's already been watching Rome from previous episode to see that he's kind of low key making a move on Keyshawn. He's not an up and up guy. Like he, there's something that he can tell. He usually is in the corner observing things. Like he's a very wise person. So he goes and he, um, she goes to Rome's hotel room. He brings out, um, a pair of stripper heels and tells her that this is supposed to be one of the lines they're gonna sell. Like he's creating his perfect Barbie doll slash stripper pole person. That's what he's doing. She's like, but these are stripper shoes. I don't wanna be stri selling stripper shoes. He's like, but try it on, try it on. She puts it on and she looks good. She has a nice physique. Keyshawn is very beautiful. But then she starts dressing and you know putting this stuff and she's not really understanding what's happening. She's forgetting the advice her stepmom actually gave her that you need to be careful because she wasn't gonna listen. And next thing you know, Rome is now making his move. He's gonna, he's not, she's now realizing that he wasn't just a manager to help her. He was a manager who wanted to sleep with her. There are some men in this life that do stuff for you, but they expect things in return, especially in that kind of industry. They're going to expect you at some point to give up, give up some booty. So she's realizing the extent of it. She's telling him, no, you know, she doesn't want to. She's doing all the things that you would do to somebody that you don't want to sleep with. Rome starts getting aggressive and he's at the point where he's basically about to rape her. She has to kick him. She has to use the same moves that she didn't learn. She been beat up at home by her man, so she obviously knows how to do something. She kick him. He ripped her 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 bra off. She's running down the hallway with one titty out, running to Woody's room, scared, letting him know that Rome just wanted to have sex with her this whole time. That's all he wanted to do with her. He wasn't really serious about helping her or really doing the stuff that he wanted to do, and that she had to basically fight her way through. While Lil Murder and Big T could probably somewhere in there getting it in and not really knowing what's going on. Woody brings her into the room and he gives her advice saying that she her, she's actually a talented person, that her body's not just all he wanted. She actually has something good to offer. Heck, it was Keyshawn's idea in the first place to even get Lil Murder this far. So she's very bright in her head and she also knows what she's, what you know, what, what she can do. She also knows her worth. So then we got um, Keyshawn now crying and she's obviously wanting to go home home now because she's done with this whole tour and everything that's occurring is just too much for her but here's the problem she goes home and she's ready to see her man she's ready to see her baby right she goes over to her baby her firstborn and she's you know doing what every mother would do she's touching him she's you know trying to you know get get him you know hug him touch him make sure that he knows that she missed him and he's squirming and crying like he's in pain so she's like what's wrong with him what's wrong she takes him to the hospital and when they lifted that boy's shirt, if you see the kind of bruises that are on that poor baby, it was so hard to see. I, I, it was 
the boy is three years old and he had bruises like a grown man on his body all over there were some that looked like they were healing and there were some that looked like they were new not only that her his own father broke his arm his little bitty arm so Keyshawn the doctors are looking at her like what is this and Keyshawn is realizing the extent of what happened after she left her kids with him every time that he got mad she wasn't there for him to beat on so he beat on her children and at three beat on him like he was a grown man so she goes home and she's now noticing what's happened she goes to him she goes you don't want to know what the doctor said you broke his arm he's three years old you hurt him she put the kids in the room she said you hurt him and he's like nonchalant saying you know she was gone for two weeks to find a way to deflect gaslight her telling her you basically like it's her fault you left me for two weeks so it's okay for me to do what i did to our kids that's basically what he's putting it out like so Keyshawn is like no these these are our kids this is what you did type situation like she's still not letting it go and he's still trying to really argue like everything is straight and so Keyshawn basically starts putting her foot down saying you can beat on me but you are not going to beat on our kids and he's ignoring her like, you're about to, what? You're not about to tell me what to do. You're still the female in the relationship. I basically saved you from your family because you, that attitude. Keyshawn kept pushing and pressing and pressing it because she was going to stand on her firm, stand firm that she's not about to have her babies be the ones that's going to be hurt. And then he starts getting dressed saying he's going for an interview. Keyshawn gets mad and said, you ain't going to get that. Why are you going to the job? You ain't going to get it. Obviously now his manhood is hurt. So he grabs her and start really like just throwing her all over the floor like she's a rag doll. He's pulling her hair. He's yelling at her. He said, I told you to stop. You keep talking so much. She keeps like smacking her around like she's a toy. She tried defending herself. The kids are in the room hearing this screeching thing that's going on. Her mom been dragging on the floor. She's screaming. He grabbed her grabbed her by the throat, pinned her against the door. He grabs the burning iron that he was going to use, that he was using to iron his clothes and try to burn her face. Keyshawn starts screaming, please, you can do it anywhere but my face. As in, you can burn my body, just don't burn my face. I'm like, first of all, why does he have to burn any part of you? It was just, this entire episode was so triggering and so excruciating. It was hard to watch. It was so hard to watch. I, I, I didn't know how to, there was just so many crazy scenes from the attempted rape to the, 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 the abuse to the kids, to her getting pregnant, to her stepmother and her father's dynamic and all the, you know, the, the being put down and being overlooked and feeling like she's just in that, she's not, you know, good enough for people to, understanding how Keyshawn got to the point where she's at in life. So she's crying. He finally put the iron down, right? Then we get to the next scene where Wody goes to see Rome. Rome is having what I consider an STD party. I mean, you can smell the syphilis and you can smell the chlamydia and you can smell the potential HIV up in the air. People were just effing each other like a big old orgy. He comes into the room and he acts like he's cool. He goes to talk to Rome privately. Rome obviously lies and makes it seem like Keyshawn was just leaving for something that was her fault. He didn't do nothing. He didn't try to rape her. And y'all forget, there was one scene I forget to tell you. When Rome was in the hotel room, trying to, attempting to try and get into Keyshawn's pants, he also tried to do it in his form, like, you don't even need, need low murder. You don't need to be partnered up with him. The, I'm thinking the dude's an up and up. He's fake. He's over here being gay. And he shows her a video of low murder and Big Teak basically doing each other. He recorded them like a creep so he can have it as like leverage. And she knows about it. So she had already, when she ran back to the room, told Wody that, that this man did something like that. Like he's going, Lord, this over low murder's head and probably ruined the career that he's trying to build. Then... Wody, knowing this information, goes to Rome. Not Rome not knowing that he's already been told the extent of it by Keyshawn. He's already going to lie and say Keyshawn was lying, nothing happened, but what about the tape? So Wody, being a genius person that he is, brings out cocaine because he knows that Rome is a party person. He likes to get high off cocaine. He did not say that he laced that cocaine with fentanyl. So Rome, obviously not trusting Wody, told Wody to go first. So Wody smoked the line of the one that he knew wasn't really you know, fentanyl. Then he allowed Rome to smoke, to, 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 in, you know, snort the ones that have fentanyl. And he's talking to Rome. Rome's getting blurry. He's, you know, he's noticing something's not right. It's not the same as normal cocaine. And Woody's asking him how you want to be buried. And now he's realizing his heart is, is racing. He's about to base. He's overdosing at this point. He's dying. And Woody's just watching him, making sure that he's dead because you're not, what you did, you try to rape this girl and now you try to blackmail old dude. Okay, he's gay. We don't need everybody to know that if that's going to ruin his career like you're going to use that and whatever and try to hold over people's head you are not a good guy so Woody basically kills him and I'm not for murder obviously this is a tv show but considering his personality I wasn't upset that he died I wasn't 
It didn't matter to me if he died or not. Rome, to me, was just, he looked kind of skeezy the way that he is. But this episode was just so much. It was just so much back to back to back. I wasn't floored. I was like, this episode has so much. What's going to happen next month, next week? Like, it's just going to be, too, it's a lot. So this was this episode. I hope you guys like the p Valor review. Let me know what you guys think. Some of y'all who watch it, get into it. But I'm about to do the Basketball Wise review and also check out my description box to go to the OnlyFans page to go ahead and check out the meal I just cooked. I got three recipes up. Go and get yours, okay? You guys have a good rest of your day. Bye.